Yeah, there it is. <coughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, Michael talked to me a couple of weeks ago, like, hey, we are, we are starting the, the Java user group in, in, in Singapore, so maybe it would be nice to, to have you here and, and talk about Elasticsearch. So I work for Elasticsearch, and um, we recently released the last version, the version 5, and we consider, okay, maybe what we can do is we can talk about the new features that we introduced in version 5. Uh, before I move on, is somebody here using Elasticsearch? One guy, a couple of guys over there. What kind of use cases? I know you are using. Uh, search, login, what, what kind of use cases? OK, login use case, OK. So you collect logs, I guess, from different systems, applications, and ship it to Elastic, OK? Login also, you different use cases, yeah? Any other feedback? OK, good to know. Um, and which version of Elasticsearch are you using? Uh, are you using version 2, 1, 5? Two. 2, OK. 2? OK, that's good. It's pretty OK. So let's see if we have. Yeah, we have some more. Yes, that's good. So let's, this is version 5. So this is the corporate video, you know, the, the company. I thought it was, it's been great. Everything about it is better. So 5.0 means, oh. whoa, like it's incredible what we have accomplished. The entire Elastic Stack has evolved so much and become so much more consistent and easy to get started. Uh, I think the initial experience is, is just going to be one of pleasure. 5.0 is going to be the first really big step towards unifying our stack. Previously, we had, you know, you had Kibana 4 and Logstash 2 and Elasticsearch 1, and it was difficult to figure out what would work with what. 5.0 represents a way of helping show that we are a unified suite of projects. We have Logstash, Kibana, Beats, Elasticsearch, and this is the first time that they all kind of feel like they're one product. We have the same version, we do the releases at the same time, so we know that they work together, get tested together, and it's a more integrated experience. This all looks and feels like one product, so to me that is really exciting. 2.0 was a very big release that fixed a lot of stuff, but didn't add that much. And 5.0 is different because we're building on the foundations that were laid in 2.0, but it is so full of features, so full of cool new stuff that I think users are going to love it. The, the amount of effort that I've seen going to 5.0 is amazing. And I've gotten so used to it. Whenever I go back to 2.0, which really wasn't that long ago, it was a year ago, I'm like, ugh, what am I doing here? And so now that I'm on 5.0, I can't wait for other people to experience it because it, it'll be like a whole new, much better product for them. So this is like a quick summary of what, what we have been doing in the last time. Um, so let's, let's talk about this. First of all, who am I? As I mentioned, uh, I work for Elastic. Uh, my name is Matias, and I am originally from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. Uh, I have been living in different places for the last around uh, eight years or so. So I spent a couple of years in Europe, uh, different places in Europe, and now based in Singapore. My background is software development. So uh, I used to write application. I used to write code for several years uh, until I decided to switch to a different kind of role. But still, I, I write code. <laughs> uh, and basically, my toolbox, I have Java, Python, Node.js. So probably those are my main programming languages when I need to do something. Um, I have been working with open source, either using open source or working for open source companies for the last eight years. Uh, before Elastic, I used to work for MongoDB. I worked for MongoDB for a couple of years also. Uh, so my background is open source, strongly open source. And with Elasticsearch specifically, I started to use Elasticsearch approximately two years ago. And I joined Elastic as a company like a bit more than a year ago. Uh, my role here in Singapore is what we call uh, solutions architect. And the idea of solutions ar architect is a mix between uh, let's say, a customer-facing role and a technical role. So it's a mix between both, uh, both worlds. Uh, what I try to do is I try to help users, to help customers uh, to be successful using our technology. In different places in Asia Pacific, uh, Michael tried to <laughs> arrange a meetup a couple of times, and I was always traveling somewhere. Sorry about that. Uh, 
I would like to spend more time in Singapore, so happy to, to be here tonight. Um, I like memes, so make everybody. <laughs> um, so this is what we call the Elastic Stack. Uh, I asked before who is using Elasticsearch in this room, but we also have other technologies, like Kibana or Logstash or Beats, or we also have a cloud service uh, running in, in AWS, by the way. So uh, this is what we call the Elastic Stack. Um, we also have what we call this uh, X pack that these are commercial extensions. These are paid, let's say, paid software on top of this open source stack. But some people may ask, hey, if I, have a, if, if I pay to Elastic, do I get something like Elasticsearch Enterprise version or something like that? The answer is no. There is only one version of Elasticsearch, and it's open source. We have plugins or add-ons on top of that, but the core is open source. So there is nothing like, oh, I need to migrate, I need to go from open source to enterprise version. No, just one version. So why we, we have this big jump in the version numbers? You know, we used to have version 1, 1.7, one, 1.0, one something. Then we had version 2, 2.1, two, 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 2.2, two, two, 2.3, two, 2.4, and then we jump to version 5. Maybe you are going to think, oh, these guys, they introduce a lot of new stuff. They introduce a lot of features. Actually, we did, but not to justify three numbers, you know. Uh, the reason why we have version 5 is that, as I mentioned, we have different components in our open source stack. We have Kibana, we have Logstash, we have Bits. And some people suffer with this matrix of hell, like, oh, if I need to use Elasticsearch 2 point something, it's compatible with Kibana 4 point something, and Bits 1 point something. And that was a matrix of hell. And was not easy for, for everybody to, to use this. So one of the things that we introduced uh, approximately six, seven months ago was this idea of that we call internally unified release process. And that means that we have all these projects are open source projects, totally different projects, totally isolated. For example, Elasticsearch is written in Java. Kibana is written in Node.js. Uh, Beats is written in Golang. Logstash is written on, in Ruby, but runs on JRuby, on a JVM. Uh, so totally different isolated projects. But one of the things that we wanted to have is a unified release process. Means that everybody releases at the same time. And the next step, when we achieved that, the next step was, okay, now we want to have a consistent version numbering. So if we release a new version, you're going to have a new version of all the components. So now you don't need to know this compatibility matrix of hell, you know? So it's much easier. So the idea is we want to make the, the life of, of Beans, you know, from Pulp Fiction easier, so he's not confused anymore. And that's why we talk about version five. It's the new, the new let's say, consistent versioning across all our components. He's more happy. Uh, so let's talk about the Elasticsearch. Uh, who never heard about the Elasticsearch? Come on, don't be shy. Nobody? That's good, okay, good. Elasticsearch, imagine some people, if you search in Wikipedia, probably you're going to find something like it's a search and analytics engine in real time. Wow, nice. Uh, you can imagine it's, it's like a data store. Actually, some people may use Elasticsearch as a database. I am not saying that's a good idea. Please don't get me wrong, <laughs> but some people may do it. Uh, so you can imagine it's something that you can store information, you can retrieve information. And a couple of interesting things to talk about. First of all, it's, it's very easy to use because the interface that Elasticsearch exposes to the rest of the world is HTTP REST. So it's very easy. It's HTTP protocol, and basically what you are going to do when you store information, actually the way how do we call that is when you index information in Elasticsearch, or when you retrieve information in Elasticsearch, what is going through the wire it's a JavaScript object, JSON, through HTTP protocol. So it's very easy. We also have some client libraries, and Florian is going to talk about that later, that these libraries are going to wrap this HTTP protocol, but at the end it's HTTP protocol. And it's based on Apache Lucene. Apache Lucene is, is an information retrieval software library uh, that has been around for more than 10 years now. Florian? 20 years. Yeah, so, so the very long run. So it was created by Doug Cutting, the creator of Hadoop. So he initially first created Apache Lucene, 
then he stopped working there and <coughs> created Hadoop. Uh, and the idea is a low-level, uh, let's say, library to build information retrieval on top of that. And what is another interesting feature about Elasticsearch is that Elasticsearch is, is going to run as a server because it's a HTTP server at the end. And when you need to scale, you can scale in horizontal way. So if you need to deal with more information, if you need to deal with a higher throughput, a higher number of requests per second, when you need to scale, the way to scale is you add more servers in parallel, and Elasticsearch is going to balance the information across these different servers. We call them nodes, different Elasticsearch nodes. And using the same idea of multiple servers, we can also guarantee high availability. So it means that the information is going to have multiple copies in different nodes, in different servers. So if one server goes down, your application can continue working because there are copy, copies of this information somewhere else. That's in a nutshell. You can index everything that you want. Something in structure, like when, when you have well-defined fields, or something unstructured, like full text, for example. I have a bunch of text. I want to index in Elasticsearch, and I want to have very fast text search. You can also do it. For example, if you are using Wikipedia, when you go to Wikipedia and you search, that search is coming from Elasticsearch. When you use Tinder, if somebody here is using Tinder, it's not my case. I am a married person. But if somebody here is using Tinder, Tinder is, Tinder is using Elasticsearch for those searches. Uh, so when you swipe left, swipe right, all those searches are powered by Tinder. Um, so um, it's, it's, some people may ask, oh, but, but this is like a login solution. It's a security solution. Not really. It's, it's, it's like a data platform that can be used for different use cases. And what you get at the end of the day, you get very fast searches and very fast aggregations. When I, when, when I say aggregations, I mean imagine when you want to group information, you want to generate some facets, you want to execute some arithmetic, whatever, very fast in real time. That's, a, that's at the end of the day, what do you get? If you ask, OK, what is the difference I mentioned before? It's, imagine it's like a database. If you ask, what is the difference between, and, and now let's forget about the Elasticsearch. What is the difference between a database and a search engine? Any idea? Pick any database and pick any search engine. Any clue? Any thoughts around that? Think about when you query information. What's, what's the main difference? In database, it's more like a, a yeah. file type is a long, uh, different type of data. But I need to go random search, random indexing. But in the database, it's properly defined. Uh, in that, uh, I can search properly rows and columns, why, where, proper. Yeah, that. Structure data and unstructured. Yeah, it, it's still in Elasticsearch, you can have a structure. You can have like a well defined fields if you want. Actually, if you think the, the main difference is that in a search engine, everything is indexed. All the fields are indexed, all the context is indexed. In a database, you explicitly need to create the indices. Otherwise, your queries are going to be slow. So this means that in a database, in some way, you need to know in advance your access patterns. You need to know in advance how you're going to query the information. Otherwise, if you don't have an index, it's going to run a full table scan. And again, pick any database. Pick MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, MongoDB. Pick any database. They are going to run a full table scan because there is no way to find that information. You need to know in advance the access pattern. While in a search engine, everything is indexed. If you want to start making very complex search criteria, up to you. Everything is indexed. So that's, that's the, 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 the main difference. So let's talk about. Uh, specifically about what, what we introduce in version 5. Uh, for those who are already using Elasticsearch, uh, may know that usually when you index text in Elasticsearch, uh, basically there are like two approaches. One approach is I want to treat this text as a, as a value. And I don't want to run any kind of, let's say, uh, process when I index that text. So let me give an example. If I'm going to index uh, Twitter usernames, I don't want to have any process like lowercase. I, I just want to index the string as it is. And this usually in the, in the Lucene world, it's, it's called 
uh, a, a string that is not analyzed. Means that we are going to treat the string as a atomic value, and that's it. On the other side, imagine if you want to index uh, like, a, like a text, imagine an article in Wikipedia. Probably you want to do some pre-processing, you know? You want to probably lowercase all the text, you want to remove the stop words, you, you want to apply some, some logic behind, like synonyms, etc., steaming, etc. So what we did in version 5, we make those two different, uh, let's say, use cases very easy to understand. And we introduced two new types. The first case, the case when we use the text as a text without any kind of analysis or process, we call keyword. And the text, when you want to run some kind of analysis, like lowercase, removing stop words, etc., we call it text. Uh, it's not only about this, it's only also about how do we store these keywords and this text on disk. So it's going to be much more efficient, especially when, when you store keywords on disk. The next interesting thing is, um, it's about relevance. So imagine when you go to Google and you search for something. Imagine you search for uh, PayPal. Probably if you search for PayPal, the first link that Google is going to show probably is the PayPal website. Why? Because of that is because of the relevance. In all these results that you get from Google, probably hundred thousands or probably more, hundred millions of pages that contains text PayPal or something similar to PayPal, the most relevant result is, of course, the PayPal website. And in information retrieval, how do you measure that? Usually we talk about scoring. And the idea of a scoring is a number that we are going to assign to all the results that are going to measure how much relevant is a specific document for the query that you just execute. Does it make sense? So one of the things that we change in Elasticsearch version 5 is we change the algorithm that we use to generate these scores. Uh, so in the old days, we used to use an algorithm that it's called term frequency inverse document frequency, TFIDF, if you search in the, in the docs. And now we are using something that, according to the information retrievers specialists, is, is a much uh, better solution, a much, let's say, a state of art. I don't know if you have any experience with BM25. Yeah, it's, it's something that, may, oh, again, in the, this information retrieval world, there is a lot of people that knows a lot. You know, and it's, it's very low level. How, how do you measure the relevance? Uh, but according to these guys, it seems this is a much better algorithm than TFIDF. Another in interesting thing is that now in Elasticsearch, you're going to store, uh, and that's the next slide, you're going to store very long numbers. And basically, this can be applicable for different use cases. Like, for example, if you want to store timestamps with nanoseconds precision, or if you want to store IPv6. All these cases basically are a very long number, something that doesn't fit in an integer or, or a normal number, let's put it that way. So now we have support for, for very big numbers, and one of these, of course, is IPv6. We change. Uh, Initially, uh, one of the questions outside was, uh, hey, Elasticsearch <laughs> is a search engine, but there are a lot of people that is using Elasticsearch for logging or for metrics for different use cases, which is true. Uh, and all these kind of use cases, uh, sometimes a lot of the content that you index in Elasticsearch are numbers. Like, for example, imagine the, the, the typical access logs from your Apache web server or your Nginx web server. You're going to have... Uh, response code, response size, timestamp. There is no text. Actually, the only text is the URL, probably, uh, and, and the HTTP request type. Uh, this means that a lot of people is using Elasticsearch and is putting a lot of numbers inside Elasticsearch. So we improve a lot how do we store numbers inside Elasticsearch. And to do this, uh, we are using a new structure, a new data structure. It's called block KD trees. Uh, you can find very fancy videos in YouTube about how these, these data structures work. But the idea is that dealing with numbers in Elasticsearch is going to be much more efficient. Actually, right now, it's, it's more efficient. Uh, because it's faster to read, it's faster to, to basically write, read, and also it's smaller on disk. So everything is good. 
uh, we also introduced something called um, half precision numbers. Again, I mentioned that some people, they also collect information about their, their servers or applications in Elasticsearch. So imagine if you collect metrics like CPU consumption, memory consumption, you're going to have numbers like, for example, a percentage. The CPU usage is 37.5%. Uh, in the old days, you pay the price of a float number that is at least four bytes, depends on the implementation, at least four bytes, uh, just for storing this two digits precision number. So we introduce something that we call half precision numbers that basically are like scale floats. So it's a float, but internally we store it as an integer. So which means that it's, again, faster to read, faster to write, and smaller on disk. And we can also use this for geo, uh, because Elasticsearch is used a lot also for geo purposes. When you want to index information that has lat long information. So for example, when you write Uber, and you can find these videos uh, made by the people of, of Uber talking about how do they use Elasticsearch, they aggregate in real time by location how many cars do they have in each location <coughs> of the city. And based on the demand, they can change or they can drive, they can push the drivers to go to other parts of the cities. So for all these analytics in real time, they use Elasticsearch. And as you may imagine, the, the information has that long for all these car positions. Um, this idea of using block KD trees can also be applied to geo-information. And this is a very nice example. This is a video that is also available in YouTube. In this case, we have the city of London, and we have different points of interest. And when the density of points is higher, so if I am outside, if I'm close to Heathrow, probably not so many things that are interested. But if I'm close to the city center of London, there are a higher number of points of, point of interest. <coughs> the size of the cells that Lucene is going to apply when it stores this information are going to be more dense, are going to be smaller. So this is a nice video to see how, how this is working. So imagine when I start indexing all these points at low level, when there are a low density of points, it's going to use a very big grid size. And when the density of points is higher, it's going to use a smaller cell size. So you only pay the overhead of a very small grid size when it's needed. You don't pay a very small grid size when you are in Heathrow. Does it make sense? So it's an adaptive approach based on these grids, and that depends how many points are indexed in that grid, in that cell, actually. And this is something that was also introduced in, in version, uh, version 5. Tinder, again, <laughs> it also has geolocation. Uh, so same idea. These are all public numbers. Uh, so if you go to benchmark.elastic.co, it's, it's our website, we have these nightly benchmarks uh, that runs every night with all our, actually here you, you have the different versions and you have the master version. So this is coming directly from GitHub. So the, the last <laughs> source code. And we run all these benchmarks every night to find any performance regression in case we screw up something. Uh, so when I'm, I'm telling you that it's two times faster, three times faster, you can go and check by yourself. Also, the, uh, the previous one was throughput. Of course, the higher, the better. Version <coughs> 5, version 2, version 1. The okay. time? Sorry, the, the version 5, the last one is on, that's run, was running on the Docker. Yeah, th this is because we uh, recently introduced a kind of semi-official Docker images. And, and basically, it's a Docker image that internally has Elasticsearch version 5. So basically, what we are measuring is, is if there is any additional overhead because of Docker, you know, when you run Elasticsearch. Because of the C groups, let's say. It's not because of Docker. Because of the C groups nature that Docker relies on. So again, if you want to check more details on this, go to benchmarks.elastic.co. You can check it out by yourself. Painless. Uh, in Elasticsearch, when you execute queries, or when you execute aggregations, or when you execute different kind of operations, you can execute script 
if you want. Like if you want to have a complex processing or aggregate numbers based on a complex criteria, you can execute your own scripts. In the old days, uh, we used to rely on different scripting languages. Uh, so for example, in the, the last one that we relied was uh, Groovy. But one of the issues with any scripting language that you rely is that there is no way to run scripting language in a totally safe sandbox mode. You know, if, I, if I'm running a, a Groovy scripting engine, potentially somebody, for example, may open a socket or may execute something that maybe is going to kill my server or do something that is not allowed. And there is no way. We talked with these guys from Groovy, from the <laughs> programming language, and we asked, oh, we, we need to sandbox Groovy. We need to, to make Groovy completely secure. And basically, they told us, there is no way. There is always going to be a way to work around and execute malicious code if somebody wants. So what we did, the only way that we found <laughs> to make totally sandbox is we create our own scripting language. Of course, this is not a general purpose scripting language. Uh, so we don't want people using this scripting language for other stuff. No, we, we are not going that way. This is a very small subset of a scripting language. So you can get methods to access objects, retrieve fields, retrieve values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, some uh, flow control structures like for loop, switch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but that's it. But what you get at the end of the day is two, two main things. The first one is it's much faster because it's, it's very basically a sandbox a scripting environment that only is going to translate these new, let's say, keywords, new operations into pure Java. And the most important thing is safe, is secure. If somebody wants to open a socket, there is nothing like a socket in this scripting language. So it cannot be done. So the main motivation is, is, is not about performance, it's, it's about uh, being 100% sandbox. Question on that slide. Yeah. So are you getting to define your language there? Where it's yeah. Defined painless? Yeah, actually, in version 5, the default is going to be painless. That was internal, yeah. If you don't specify, it's going to be painless. But you can just still specify something else. Groovy. If you want to use Groovy, you're going to still use it. Okay. But uh, probably you need to, starting in version 2, Elasticsearch runs in Java, runs using the security manager. You know, the JVM provides something called security manager. And I can imagine that if you want to use Groovy, you need to provide additional permissions on the security manager. Uh, the default is painless. And, and if you check the syntax, the syntax is quite similar. It's a mix between Groovy and JavaScript in some way. Uh, so in this case, yeah, what I'm going to do, I'm going to execute a function score. Remember before when we talk about relevancy, this is a score that measures how well a document match a query. So you can define your own functions. So in this case, we are defining a function that is generated by this script. For these kind of use cases, like the one you mentioned, like logging, or uh, if you want something, if you want to index something that is time-based information, time-based information is, is something with a timestamp, basically. <laughs> um, usually, the typical approach is that people is going to create time-based indices. Maybe one index per day, maybe one index per week, maybe one index per month, depends on your needs. But that's usually the recommended approach. So imagine in this scenario, I have uh, if I want to query, okay, I want to execute a specific query from today up to four days ago, I need to hit approximately four different indices. But if you check this, this kind of queries, the nice thing about this index, this index, this index, is that if I execute the same query, the response that is going to come from these indices is exactly the same. Because the information in these indices didn't change. Is it clear? So I'm indexing my logs. So logs from today I'm going, are going to the index with today name, and so on. So if you check the indices, let's say, in the middle, the information never changed. Can only change the query condition here and here, but never in the middle. So one of the things that we introduced in version 5 is something called shared request cache, which means that Elasticsearch is going to keep this shared request uh, cache <laughs> in memory, so when you hit, imagine with the same query, actually not exactly the same query, because if you say now, you execute the query now and four days ago, and you execute the same query 10 seconds after four days ago, it's not exactly the same query. The timestamp condition moved 10 seconds. But still, the indices in the middle 
are going to return exactly the same results. So what we can do is we can be very aggressive on the caching, because it's exactly the same result. So what we introduce in version 5 is, is this shard request cache that is enabled by default. And to implement this, we need to refactor a lot how the query engine works. So this was a very, very big effort from the engineering team, how Elasticsearch internally processes all the queries. So what do you mean? If you're using Kibana, or if you're using any kind of application that aggregates logs information, it's going to be much faster. Because all the information that is retrieved from the middle is cache. Rollover API. Let's talk, again, uh, let's talk again about this use case of daily indices. Imagine I have a website. Imagine I have PayPal. <laughs> I, I am like Elon Musk in the, at the beginning. So imagine I have PayPal, and I have my logs, and I put my logs on daily indices. Probably the traffic that PayPal is going to have on weekdays probably is higher than the traffic that PayPal is going to have on weekends, or maybe the opposite. I don't know. But you see the point. It's, it's not exactly the same amount of logs that you're going to generate, because that depends on your business, that depends on your use case, that depends on the nature of your business. So if you take this approach of having one index per day, you may end with something like this. Some indices may be much bigger than other indices, depending if the day is weekend or weekday. Is it clear? And this is something that usually is not nice to have, because a lot of things, when Elasticsearch is going to balance information, when it's going to partition information, it's going to happen at index level. So it's nice to have all the indices approximately of the same size in these kind of scenarios. So how do we do that? In version 5, we introduce something called rollover API. And the idea is that instead of having, for example, a daily index, imagine logs 2016, uh, November 10, logs 2016, November 11th. Instead of having that, you are going to have something like logs 00001. Logs, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2. And Elasticsearch is going to automatically create a new index. It's going to create logs, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, based on any condition that you can define. For example, the number of documents. So in that case, you can define something like, OK, create a new index every time the previous index <coughs> has 10,000 documents, or 1 million documents, or once the previous index is at least seven days old. So Elasticsearch is going to create a new index. It's going to create an index alias. In Elasticsearch, we have something called index alias. Imagine it's like a symbolic link in Linux. So it's like an index that can point to one or more indices. So it's like a symbolic link in Linux, same idea. Uh, so it's going to have an index alias that is going to point to all these set of indices. Does it make sense? And for you, it's transparent. What you get at the end of the day is you can easily move from this to this all the indices from the same size. And you can define uh, complex conditions based on time, based on documents, based on size, etc. Shrink API. Um, who is familiar here with the idea of shards? In Elasticsearch, there is something, there is a magic word called shard. <laughs> uh, the idea of a shard, when you create an index in Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch is going to partition the index into a smaller pieces that we call shards. And the default setting is five. Means that when you create an index in Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch internally is going to create five Lucene indices. Does it make sense? So one of the things that sometimes happen is that people have too many shards for the size of information they have. So maybe they define, OK, I'm going to have for this index 20 shards. And maybe they only index, at the end of the day, they only index, I don't know, 10 megabytes. And they are paying the price of having 20 shards only for 10 megabytes of data, which is not recommended at all. Usually, you can accommodate several gigs per shard. So when the people want to fix that, oh, I want to reduce the number of shards, if you want to do that, you must re-index the information. There is no easy way. Actually, there was no easy way until version 5. In version 5, we introduce something shrink API. And the idea of shrink API is that we are going to reduce the number of shards to a factor of the original number of shards. So imagine if I have 20 shards, I can reduce to 5, to 4, or to 1. Does it make sense? Why it's a factor? 
because at low level, this is implemented with all kind of complex sim links, sim links logic. So it's going to start duplicating sim links, and that's why it must be a factor. So bottom line, bottom line, don't use prime numbers in your <laughs> uh, in your shards numbers. Uh, so this is something that, for example, if I have this index and I want to reduce the number of shards, I just specify on the shrink API how many number of shards do I want to have, and this is going to shrink all these shards. And this is going to be very fast because, as I mentioned, it's based on the implementation is based on symbolic links. If you are asking, if you are, if you ask, what happens if I run in Windows? Oh, internally, it's going to reindex. Because in Windows there is no symbolic links, but if you are if you are running Elasticsearch on a file system that supports sim links, it's going to be very this is going to be very fast. It's very cheap. Java REST client. I'm going to skip this slide. This gentleman is going to describe this in, de in detail, so I'm not going to talk about this. In just node, uh, for example, you are using Elasticsearch for login. How do you send information to Elasticsearch? How do you collect these logs? Okay, so you have Logstash. Logstash is reading the logs and sending to Elasticsearch. That is one approach. The other guy, you were using login also, Elasticsearch? How, what did you use to collect the logs? Exposing to the Kafka stream and then... Okay, Kafka, and then from Kafka, what do you use to read from Kafka? Logstash or something else? Logstash, okay. So, this is a common use case. I, I want to, for example, send logs from different places. Maybe I have 1,000 servers generating logs. You know, nowadays it's this idea of microservices architecture. Everything is distributed. We collect logs everywhere, and we need to ship these logs to Elasticsearch. One approach is, for example, you can put Logstash in your servers and this collect the logs. But imagine if you have, for example, again, 1,000 servers. You are paying the price of Logstash in your 1,000 servers. What do I mean with the price of Logstash? Logstash is not cheap to run. From CPU and memory perspective, it's not cheap. Why? Because it's Java. I know this is a Java user group, sorry about that. But let's be honest, you know, the, the footprint that you get on CPU and memory of a Java application is going to be higher than other technologies. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's what it is. So that's why we introduce something called bits. And bits are these lightweight, low memory footprint agents that, for example, if you want to collect logs, you can use something called FileBit that is a very small program. The footprint, I think, in memory is something like 14 megabytes, one, one four of RAM, very low CPU footprint. Of course, it's much more limited in functionality compared with Logstash. There is no processing, there is nothing. It's just collect logs and ship it to Elasticsearch. Collect logs and ship, that's it. And some people use bits for this. Because again, you pay only 14 megabytes of RAM in all your servers. Why this is much lightweight? By the way, Bits is implemented in Golang. Golang is a statically compiled language, no virtual machine. So it's very small footprint. So, but what happens is that some people, if they want to have some enrichment of the logs, or maybe they want to uh, be consistent on the field names, like for example, if you want to use something like common event format or any log standard format that you want to use, if they need to process these logs, they need a logstash somewhere. So they, they hide these file bits, sending logs to logstash. In logstash, you, do, you run all these pre-process, and then logstash ships the logs to Elasticsearch. And people may say, oh, but now I need to introduce another component. I need to introduce logstash just to run this minimal enrichment, minimum process. So that's why we introduce something called ingest node. And the idea of ingest node is one node, can be one or more, in your Elasticsearch cluster that is going to run this, let's say, process before the documents are indexed into the same cluster. So imagine that you send the logs and you want to change the field names. Maybe you want to remove fields because there is some private information. Or anything that you want to run is a subset of features. You don't need to deploy Logstash for that. This Pre-process can happen in the Elasticsearch cluster itself using this new feature. Another interesting example is, for example, if you want to index PDF documents into Elasticsearch, that's another common use case also, or Word documents or Excel files, whatever. Uh, usually when you need to extract content from these formats, it's very uh, CPU intensive and memory intensive. 
if you rely on libraries like Apache, Tika, all these libraries are very CPU memory intensive. Um, so some people, they, they rely on external tools to do that. You can use an inches node to run that. So you can have a dedicated node that is only going to extract the content from these documents and then index into Elasticsearch. What you get from this? Simplified architectures. You need to deploy less components to achieve what you want to achieve. Bootstrap checks. Uh, I love Pulp Fiction, by the way. Uh, this is what we want to avoid. Why? Because we have seen people running production cluster like this. You know? Um, <laughs> so we have seen people that we have a support team worldwide in different places in the, of the world. And, and sometimes these guys, they need to deal with, with very bad things. You know, like for example, corruption, file corruption. And that happens because they didn't take care of the proper settings of Elasticsearch. Or sometimes even the operative system, not Elasticsearch, the OS level. Like for example, let me give you an example. Elasticsearch is, is quite aggressive on the number of file descriptors that it's going to use. This is because of the nature of Lucene. Lucene is going to create new files because Lucene wants to keep the files immutable. If something is immutable, we can be very aggressive on the caching. So Elasticsearch, uh, Lucene is going to create a lot of files, usually. And of these files are going to be merged in the background, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the point is that if the limits, for example, of the open file descriptors in your operative system is not big enough, when you have all these file descriptors open, up in the air, reading information, writing information, and tries to open a new one, <clears throat> you reach the limit. And you cannot say what you have in memory. You know? Everything is dancing up in the air. So they call our support team, hey, I have corruption, I have this. So we want to avoid reaching at that point. Because sometimes, there is no way to fix that. <laughs> the shit already hit the fan, so <laughs> we, we, we cannot fix it, you know? Sorry about that. So. What do we have in version 5? We have something called bootstrap checks. And now we introduce a new, let's say, a new, a new mode of running Elasticsearch that is called development and production. And, and how we are going to detect, basically, if you bind your network interface to a different interface than localhost for the transport protocol. The, protocol. the transport protocol is a protocol that Elasticsearch uses internally. It's going to assume that you're running in production mode. It's not your laptop. It's not development environment. It's in production mode. And if you're in production mode, all these bootstrap checks must be on green state. If any of these bootstrap checks, 10 minutes, if any of these bootstrap checks is, is not green, Elasticsearch is not going to start. So you cannot start the server. Sorry to be so harsh, but it's, believe me, <laughs> help me to help you. So we want to avoid you to having these bad issues. So one of the things we're going to check, as I mentioned, file descriptors, virtual memory size. Be sure that your machine is not swapping. If you swap, performance goes down. Uh, you have enough threads from the operative system side. JVM running in server mode, et cetera, et cetera. If any of these is not checked, Elasticsearch doesn't start. All of them should be green. If you have anything, and it doesn't matter if it's virtual, physical, it's going to be quite blind. You know, like okay, if you are running in production mode, if any of this is not checked, I'm not going to start. Sorry. Because again, we we have seen bad things. Sorry about that. Um, dots in field names. This is a very, very probably you you know about this. This is a very, very long story. Uh, in the old days, Elasticsearch allowed you to have uh, field names with dots. Like, I can have a field name, for example, first.name, last.name. That was valid. In version 2, we said, no, that's not valid anymore. Because sometimes, if you have a JSON object, I don't know if the dot is just the field name, or I don't know if you have a nested object, you know, an object inside an object. So there is a confusion over there. So in version two, we went quite radical, and we said, OK, no more dots in field names. You cannot have it. So if you have dots in your field names, you must re-index your information. 
But for some people, that was a bit painful. So in version 5, dots are back. <laughs> so if you want to use dots, but are not enabled by default. You must enable it with the settings. Actually, the same happens in version 2.4. You must If you want to use dots, you must enable a special settings. But by default, are disabled. But if you want, OK, you can do it. So is it but, but you must change the settings. Um, a couple of extra improvements. Uh, to mention some of them, faster storage, OK. Refresh. This is a, a very classic use case. Imagine I go to a website. I have a form in a web page. I input, imagine, my personal information, click on Submit, and then on the next screen, I'm going to show information I just filled in, in in the previous form. Typical scenario, you know? Post, redirect after post, and show another page with the information. What happens if between the redirect and the get to the next screen, the information is not yet available? The information is going to be missing. And internally, Elasticsearch is going to refresh all these indices at low level by default every one second. So it means that Elasticsearch is going to refresh all these search structures every one second. So it means that if I imagine I save, and then I go to the screen, and that screen arrives before the next refresh, the information is not going to be there. In version 5, we introduce a way to work around that. And basically, the idea is that when you save the information, you can specify when you save, do not acknowledge the save, do not acknowledge the index until the index is being refreshed. So you have the guarantee that when you go to the next screen, the information is going to be there. This is a quite typical use case of, about consistency. I want to finish with the versions compatibility. If you, so if you are using version Elasticsearch, version one something, two something, five something, if you are using Elasticsearch version 5, it means that you can read indices created with version 5, of, of course, and indices created with Elasticsearch version 2. If you are using Elasticsearch version 1, and you want to migrate from 1 to 5, you cannot just change the binaries. You must re-index the information, because it's a different format. And, and this is a nice diagram that, that explains, you know. If I want to upgrade from 1.7 to 2.4, you don't need to re-index. If I want to index from 2.4 to 5, you don't need to re-index. But if you want to go from 1 to 5, you must re-index. And like in any major version upgrade in Elasticsearch, major is when we change the first number, 1, 2, 5, you must shut down your cluster. So if you have 3 nodes, 5 nodes, 10 nodes, 100 nodes of Elasticsearch, you must shut it down for major version upgrades. For minor version upgrades, you can do it in rolling fashion, like you shut down one node at a time, replace the binary, restart. But for major version upgrades, you must shut it down. Is it clear? I want to finish with this. I want to finish just with, with a quick demo. This is, for example, the new version of Kibana. So let me pause the refresh. Uh, so this is the new version of Kibana, the new design. So in this case, uh, as I mentioned, Elasticsearch can be used for different things. So in this case, I am sampling information from the Singapore LTA, Singapore Land Transport Authority. They have these public APIs that provides information about the traffic in real time. It's very nice. So for example, I can see all the traffic advisories, where these traffic advisories occur, which devices are being used. You can find all these, uh, you know, Singapore is a very green, green country, so if you search for plant, you're going to see all these uh, plant pruning messages, you know, when they take care of the plants in the highway. Uh, so they put all these messages, <laughs> plant pruning, plant watering, a uh, couple of use cases with Singapore LTA. Uh, this is uh, car park availabilities, also provided by Singapore LTA. So if you go to Vivo City on Sunday, probably it's not a good idea. But if you want, if you still want to go and you want to park in Vivo City, you can check these APIs and see if you can, if you can park your car. Um, these are traffic incidents. So we have roadworks, vehicle breakdown, accidents, what all these accidents occur. And, and of course, in Elasticsearch, as I mentioned, it's very, far, very powerful on geo. If I want to, for example, let me zoom in. If I want to focus on accidents on the, around the CBD area, 
I can filter there, and everything is updated in real time. Oh, nice. We have a wrong mapping here. <laughs> um, but you see the idea. Everything is updated in real time, and everything is geo. Uh, I think the last example I have here. Here we have earthquake information. Uh, so we track different earthquakes around the world. And also nuclear blasts, by the way, because from, from the sensors, it looks like an earthquake. It's not the same, but looks like the same. Same, same, but different, you know? Um, this is a very nice one. This is, uh, you know, this ADS, this information that is, is used by the airplanes. So this is one of my colleagues in Japan. They have, uh, he has this raspberry in his place, and he collects all, all this information, and they put this information. This is in real time. So look, this is the last 15 minutes, uh, all the flights around Tokyo. So this is <laughs> my colleague in Japan. And I think that's all I have. Yeah, this is the new monitoring UI. Something nice. Take a look. That's all I have for tonight. Any question? I have more slides happy to present, but, but, but it's going to be very long. Yeah, but if, but if, if you want, I'm going to be around. If you want, I can, I can show you what I have. No worries. Okay. What is UI visualization you showed us earlier? Is it part of the Elastic This is Kibana, by the way. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we have this Elastic stack. We have Elastic Search. Imagine it's where the information lives. Kibana is, is, is a UI if you want to get analytics on the information that you have in Elasticsearch. And we have Logstash and Bits to send information into Elasticsearch. So this is Kibana. This is also open source. So it's Node.js, uh, JavaScript on the server side, and uses uh, the Elasticsearch HTTP REST API. Just figured out how many minutes break. So uh, if you have more questions, you might yeah. ask, you can do it. Happy, happy to take them. Thank you, guys. Uh,